OK, so you probably noticed that uh, the notes are not yet complete. So there will be a second part available uh, in this morning. So probably at 10 uh, after, the, after the lecture. Uh, also, I have put, the, uh, in case you would be interested, the, the PDF file of, of the notes. Uh, you can download from my web page. So PDF file. Uh, web page so you replace and, and documents dot html and then I think it's uh, reference d uh, 13 okay so I will start by giving a very simple proof of the uh, main vanishing theorem. So re let me remind you. So you take a directed variety and then the claim was that uh, for every global differential operator, holomorphic, where A is ample, and for every anti-curve tangent to V, uh, then automatically uh, F is a solution of P. Uh, so here, uh, let me remind you that k, uh, k is the order of the operator. Uh, it's the number of derivatives involved. And m is the degree. m is the degree of the polynomial here uh, in terms of the derivative, the weighted degree. Actually, uh, to uh, remind what is the degree, you just count the number of primes. Okay, so if you have a Vronskian, if you have a Vronskian, you have three primes. One, two, three. So it's of degree three. So it's a total number of primes that occur. Because when you, you, you put, uh, you, you replace uh, T by lambda T, of course, uh, the number of lambda that, that uh, get out is the number of primes, total number of primes. Okay, so it's very easy to understand. Mm. Okay, so uh, proof of this in the special case, uh, where f is a body curve. So special case. I forgot, uh, of course, x is, uh, x is projective. Anyway, you assume that there is an ample thing, so it has to be projective. Uh, so this means that it has bounded derivative with respect to some Hermitian metric, say less than 1. OK, but then uh, you can, x is compact. So you can cover uh, x by a finite number of balls. And then uh, you can uh, take some margin of security that uh, even uh, the balls of radius 1 half uh, will, still, will still cover uh, so you have balls, uh, say, uh, 
center some points pj and, and radius r, uh, say, say one, just normalize. And then they, uh, in some coordinates, and then uh, the balls of radius one half still cover. And then, of course, it's finite because uh, what it's compact. Uh, now, uh, because uh, because of this assumption, uh, there exists a fixed delta such that if if the initial point, if, if you have t0 such that f of t0 sits uh, in, in, a, in a ball, in b prime, the smaller balls, uh, then this implies that the, the full disk of radius delta as its image is still contained in the larger ball. Uh, this is because you have bounded speed, bounded speed, and you have finitely many balls. So you cannot go from here to here uh, unless you spend some time in delta. But then, by Cauchy, Cauchy inequalities, so you just write your curve as an n-tuple in the corresponding coordinates. And then you know that when you have a holomorphic function on a, on a disk of fixed radius, uh, if it is bounded, then you can bound all derivatives. So this implies that all derivatives are bounded in, in these coordinates. Uniformly, uniformly uh, on C. Of course, the, the bound depends on j. OK, but now, uh, now your polynomial is, is just a polynomial in the derivatives. And then uh, it has holomorphic coefficients in f, but you are on a compact variety, so the coefficients are bounded anyway. Because uh, okay, you, are, you have a finite number of balls. So uh, this function now is bounded. So g of t now is a bounded holomorphic function on, on C. OK, but it's not. It's not uh, with values in C, uh, it's with values uh, actually uh, in the pullback of uh, A minus 1, okay? Because if you would not have this, uh, Uh, it would be a holomorphic function, but now it's in a bundle. But it's even better. Of course, uh, you, you can raise now to some multiple, and then uh, you are here. So I, I raise to some multiple, but now A being ample, some power is very ample. And therefore, uh, this bundle, you take a section. Uh, uh, it is just uh, the sheaf of functions that vanish uh, on some hyperplane section. So you, you make it very ample. It's not the same M as, uh, sorry, it's uh, some P. OK, so you make it very ample. OK, so now you have your X, which is embedded in projective space. And then you have a. Uh, hyperplane section, which you can take uh, randomly, OK? And now you can view this actually as a, sub, as a sub sheaf of the trivial bundle. Because this just means functions, functions that vanish along h, OK? 
So this is in C now. And therefore, this function has to be constant. But also, so you have your, your uh, curve. And anyway, you can choose completely freely h. So you can choose h so that h hits the curve. And now this function is constant and has to vanish at some point of the curve, so it has to be identically 0. Okay, so you take h such that this is non-empty. And then this function is constant uh, and 0. So this is the proof. Uh, unfortunately, uh, it's, uh, it's substantially harder to prove if you don't have a Brody curve. But this is enough to prove hyperbolicity, because you know by Brody, uh, if, if, if it's going to be hyperbolic, uh, you have to exclude Brody curves, and that, that's sufficient. So this theorem is sufficient uh, to prove hyperbolicity. It's not sufficient to prove so something like Green-Griffiths, because uh, then you, you still have, uh, it's not hyperbolic, so. Okay. So now I'm going to introduce a, a, another type of bundles. So it turns out there is a, a functor in, in the category uh, in the, of, of directed varieties, which is very simple. So what you have in mind is the following thing. So you start from a projective variety or whatever with this uh, distribution of subspaces here. And then you have a tangent curve to these Vs. Okay, f of t. Now what you want is to take the one jet. So what is the one jet? The one jet of f geometrically, the geometric one jet, It's just a curve that picks f, and then uh, the line, the line defined by, by the derivative. So this is an element. It's a line. This is a line in, in V. So it's actually a, an element in the bundle, in the projectivized bundle of V. So this is a bundle, a uh, projective bundle of lines in V, not hyperplanes, lines in V. Of course, uh, you may have, uh, I, I don't require that uh, the curve is non-singular, uh, so you may have stationary points, but I always assume non-constant, so F non-constant. So in any case, because this is one variable t, here, even if there is a zero, uh, you can take the Taylor expansion, and then you remove, if, if it vanishes at some point t0 here, if f prime of t vanishes at some t0, you can always uh, take out a, uh, the vanishing order here. And then you have a, a vector now which, don't van which doesn't vanish at t0. So uh, even though you have uh, stationary points, this is always a holomorphic map, even, even uh, at, the, uh, at the stationary points. OK, so now we are going to take uh, x twiddle to be this P of V. So take
So let us look at dimensions. So suppose uh, dimension of x is n. The rank of v is r. So now the dimension of x twiddle is just a it's a it's a bundle uh, it's a bundle over x. So it's n plus the dimension of fibers uh, protective space of v. So it's r minus one. Okay, so n plus r minus one. Okay, but now, uh, so you look at this uh, lift, the one jet. So now it's a, a it's a curve uh, that sits in this x twiddle, and I claim that uh, it is actually tangent. This, this lift of the curve is tangent to a certain canonical lift v twiddle, which is a subbundle of the tangent space of x twiddle. So this is tangent to some v twiddle, which is in a tangent space to x twiddle. And uh, what is this? Well, you have, of course, uh, the projection here. So I define, I take a V twiddle to be uh, the set of tangent vectors in X twiddle. So you take a tangent vector here, you take the differential. So it will be, uh, of course, it will be a tangent vector at some point. But a point in X twiddle, you sh have to remember, it's given by a line. So it's, it's some line uh, associated with some vector in the fiber of V. Okay. Okay. And now you project onto X. You project onto X. And now this belongs, uh, this belongs to uh, Tx. But on the other hand, you have this thing at, at point x. But now you have this thing, which is a subspace of the tangent space of x at x. And therefore, uh, you may require that this belongs to that line. So this is a requirement. I require that the projection, the projection of eta, precisely sits in the line uh, defined by v. Uh, now it's a trivial check that uh, this f twiddle is actually tangent to this v twiddle. Completely obvious. Because, of course, the projection of f twiddle is f. So the projection of the derivative of f twiddle is the derivative of f. OK, so the projection of the derivative of f twiddle. Take the derivative of both. So here you have some kind of second derivative. But here you have the first derivative. But that certainly belongs to the line. Uh, well, of course, you have canceled the maybe the zeros, but it's still in the line, OK? So this is tautologically true. And uh, so now, how do you get, uh, well, let us look at the exact sequence. So x twitter is a projective bundle. So it has a tautological uh, O x twiddle uh, of minus 1. So as usual, uh, the O of minus 1 bundle is precisely that line. Okay. So the fiber, fiber here is CV, which is, uh, it's a, so it's a sub-bundle of 
the subbundle of the pullback of V uh, on, uh, on X twiddle. Okay. And now, by definition, what is a V twiddle? So V twiddle, you can project by a pi Lauer star, which is just a, well, maybe the differential. Actually, what I know by pi Lauer star is a differential. Okay, so, well, you might prefer a differential. Okay, it's the same. Okay, so you take a uh, differential. So uh, this differential, by definition, uh, arrives in this uh, line bundle. And now, what is the kernel? Well, the kernel it consists of those vectors uh, which are vertical. Because differential projection here takes them to zero, so they are, they are. Uh, this is a relative tangent bundle. This is actually the tan the, the the tangent bundle. You, you have a bundle in projective spaces. Okay, so you have x here, and here you have x twiddle, and then the fibers are this uh, projective space of the fibers, and uh, this one is just uh, the vectors that are tangent here to these projective spaces. But of course, uh, uh, there is the Euler exact sequence describing uh, the tangent, uh, bundle, the tangent uh, bundle to a projective space. So you have an, another exact sequence that computes this thing. So maybe I put it here. So it's well known that how do you compute uh, the tangents to a, a projective space, well, you take the vector space uh, that, that defines this projective space, but you have to twist it by O of 1. So you take the pullback by pi, you twist it by the O of 1 bundle, which is the dual of that one, and then you, you kill, well, when, when you, you have projective space here, oh, so Pn minus 1, you take the, the ambient vector space, but you have to kill, of course, you, you, take, you have to kill the, the Euler vector field, the vertical field. Okay, uh, projective space, uh, you just kill the, you have a quotient by C star, so you have to kill the Euler vector field. But the Euler vector field uh, corresponds to the trivial uh, so it's uh, here. It's just O X tilde. This is just a canonical injection of O X tilde minus one twisted by O X tilde of one. Okay. So you have these two exact sequences, and especially uh, you can compute everything that you want on X twiddle if you know uh, things on X, especially all churn classes, everything, riemann rohr formula, and so on, because of these two exact sequences. And what is the rank? So that's very important, of course. What are the ranks? Well, here it's a line bundle, so one. Here, a tangent space of the fiber, so it's R minus one. And therefore, uh, beat twiddle is again R. Well, here you have one, R, SV, R minus one, okay? So now you, in this, in this uh, and this completely functorial, so it's actually a functor in the category, from the category of directed spaces into itself, 
commutes, it commutes with, uh, with maps in the category. And starting from uh, dimension nr, you arrive to dimension now n plus r minus 1 r. What is important is that the rank, the rank here remains the same. So you have lifts of curves, but they still are, are described by, by a vector bundle of rank r because this is some, somehow the, some type of differential equation. You have r linear conditions, and they are kept even after you take the one jet. Now you can iterate this functor. So you take the uh, case iteration of the functor. So I will denote uh, this by xk, vk. So it just means that you, you define by induction uh, xk to be uh, p of vk minus 1. And uh, vk is just, uh, just well, this, uh, this sub-thing, which is in, uh, in the tangent space of x of... Uh, x tilde k, which is defined by the formula here. And now the, the, uh, the dimension of xk is just uh, n plus k times r minus 1. And the rank, rank of vk is always r. So these bundles were introduced by Semple, a British mathematician in uh, 1954, at least uh, when x is a surface and v is a line, corresponding to the case of, uh, of uh, rank 1 foliation on surfaces and a study of curves on su surfaces. And then I realized that this was important in hyperbolicity uh, in 93, something like this. Uh, but other people introduced independently. Somehow people in hyperbolicity attach to these bundles the uh, name of sample and my name. It's maybe unfair, but well, I don't know. Okay, I will call them sample bundles. Um, so now you have, of course, these very important line bundles, which are the OXK of one, because you have, uh, anyway, it's a projectivization of something. Uh, so you have a tautological, uh, tautological line bundle uh, associated to this construction. And now again, you have, so you have a tower. You have a tower of uh, projections. x0 is x. And of course, the, the fibers, uh, the fibers of, of each uh, vibration, this, uh, these are projective bundles of rank r, r minus 1. So it's, it's fiber is pr minus 1 here. But now you are interested in the, in the projection that goes uh, from stage k to stage k, uh, 0, which I will denote by pi k0, or pi kl to go to stage l. OK, uh, now uh, it's interesting to look at the direct image of this. So the statement. I will not give the details here. It's not hard. So if you take the direct image of the sheaf of sections of OXK of M, 
So because, of course, uh, these are just um, canonical O of ones on, on projective space. So uh, the direct image, you get polynomials of, of homogeneous degree M at each stage. But then you count the homogeneous degree according to the weight. Uh, the weight. So what you get, actually, again, is something contained in, uh, it's certainly contained in the green Griffiths. You get differential operators acting on derivatives, on jets. Actually, uh, you should uh, observe that if you look at the k minus 1 jet, so the, I, I will denote by this the case lifting, OK? So you, f uh, here, k, is the case lifting. So if you have a curve downstairs, you have a curve which lifts to, to xk. This is the case lifting, the case, case jet, projectivized jet. And now you, you can take the, the one that comes just at the lower the stage, the k minus 1, OK? And then you take the derivative of it. So now the derivative of it, precisely by definition, sits in the tautological line. So actually, this thing, uh, the derivative, defines a map from the tangent bundle of C, which is trivial, of course, to uh, to the tautological line, but the tautological line, of course, computed at the point uh, that is defined by the case lifting. So the, the actual uh, geometric picture is that you get this. And then the tautological line is precisely the bundle OXK of minus 1. So actually, you see that a section of OXK of M is something that operates on the derivative of the k minus 1 jet, namely something which operates. So if you have a section here, what you can do to this section, you associate an operator, P, and how you compute the operator. So you take the section, the value of the section at the point which is defined by the case lifting. This is an element here in the OK, OXK of M. And then you multiply it by the M's power of the derivative of the uh, K minus 1 lifting. Well. I guess it's a bit difficult to absorb this uh, if you see it for the first time. But then you see that it's, it's homogeneous in terms of lambda of degree m, holomorphic. And this will define a differential operator exactly as I said. So this is the proof that actually what you get is contained in the green Griffiths bundle. So this I have just proved. OK, but it's actually invariant. It's invariant because in this construction, you are just taking tangents. And of course, tangents don't depend on the parameterization. If you change the parameterization of the curve, you don't change the tangents. Derivatives are multiplied by, by, by the derivative of the parameter change of parameter, but not the tangents. And therefore, this point here, by a change of parameter, is not changed. And this term is just modified by uh, the derivative of the change of parameter. And therefore, you get precisely an invariant operator. So the direct image exactly consists of the sub-bundle here of invariant differential operators in the green Griffiths bundle.
Okay. And uh, now, um, well, this, uh, this is a very nice geometry, which allows a lot of calculations, so chunk classes and so on. And uh, also you can define concepts about uh, what I will call k-jet positivity or negativity. But uh, there is some trouble. So unfortunately, so there is a slight difficulty. That unfortunately, uh, contrary to uh, what is uh, happened frequently in algebraic geometry, uh, if you look at this uh, bundle OXK of one over XK, which then is projected to X, so you, you, the fiber of this is a tower is a tower of projective spaces. So uh, you might think that uh, it is relatively ample on the fibers. It's not true. So this is not is not ample. It's not relatively ample. That is uh, not ample on the fibers. But it is big. It is big. In fact, there are, uh, there are vertical divisors. Uh, you have what we call vertical divisors. OK, we have to look at the exact sequences. Mm. I'm not sure I will have time to explain that. Do you mean big or relatively? Uh, relat relatively big. Okay. Now you can you can look at the one of the exact sequences. So you have this uh, v k. So uh, you have the o uh, here. So it goes to the o x k of minus one. Okay. <laughs> This is the differential of the projection that goes from stage k to k, stage k minus 1. And the kernel, of course, is the vertical thing. Like this. But now this thing is a hyperplane, is a hyperplane in, in, in vk. So it defines a divisor. So I will take uh, dk minus 1. Uh, it defines a divisor in, in the next stage. OK, because xk plus 1 is a projectivization of vk. So you get a divisor in the, the next step of the tower, which I will denote by dk plus 1, which is just the projective space of lines of this thing contained in vk plus uh, vk. So it's contained in p of vk, which is xk plus 1 by definition. So you get the divisor. Uh, this divisor is defined only uh, for, for k at least 2. So you, you get dk. So you get, in this way, a tautological divisor. But only if, uh, starting from k at least 2, because you cannot define you need uh, 
Okay, the formal definition is dk is, as you see, it's projective space of the tangent. You have to decrease by 1. So xk minus 1 relative to xk minus 2. So you cannot define for k equal 1. Uh, it turns out that you, you, can, uh, you can show, actually, that uh, well, you have this formula, which I leave as an exercise. You have this formula, actually. Well, so just uh, it's just a completely formal uh, from the definitions. Okay, uh, but then uh, using this, you see easily that it, it, it will be big, but not ample. Uh, and therefore, uh, in fact, um, this uh, dk corresponds precisely to uh, the points that you obtain by lifting the curves that are non-regular. So you, you have uh, the regular jets. So xk regular. This consists of the k jets that are given by uh, uh, derivatives of, of germs uh, such that the first derivative is non-zero. So the regular curves. This is a K jets of regular curves. Namely curves such that the, the first derivative at zero is non-zero. And then you have the stationary curves. And uh, this is precisely a complement. So this is of stationary curves. You can check this. Uh, then it happens that the, this uh, thing uh, is just the union of, of these vertical divisors here. So the singular part, so you can check. This is dk. You have a number of components. And then you have, of course, to add the, uh, the pullbacks, uh, pk, k minus 1, minus 1, of dk minus 1, union, etc. Union, pk2 minus 1, of d2. So you have the ones, uh, essentially, these are the ones uh, which have zero derivative, but after you differentiate twice, they become non-zero. And these are the ones such that the first derivative is zero. And then uh, the case derivative, it's only the case derivative that it is non-zero. Okay, so it's like something like this. So you have to check. Okay. So you cannot expect, the, the consequence of this is that you cannot expect a Hermitian metric to have positive curvature unless it is singular. Because if it would be smooth, uh, it would be relatively ample. And this is not possible. So if you want to deal with uh, positively curved uh, emission metrics, you have to accept that they, they are going to have poles along uh, this singular set. So what I would call a singular uh, k-jet metric, by definition, so you are, one is interested in singular k-jet metrics, Well, this is by definition a uh, Hermitian matrix. Uh, on uh, on O x k of one, but such that uh, the Hermitian metric uh, is given by some weight. 
But here I do accept that these, these functions will have poles somewhere. Okay? So you have the singular set. I will uh, essentially take only analytic singularities, namely things that are given by uh, log of sum of squares of, of algebraic sections, something like this. So with analytic singularities, I will restrict to this case. And then the, you have some singularity set, which is just the set of poles of the weight, which is analytic by assumption. And what I just explained is that you cannot hope to have positive curvature unless you accept that this uh, singular set is non-empty. And probably it will have to contain these vertical divisors here, which correspond to curves which are stationary. OK, so now you, you give a definition. So you say that uh, xv has negative k-jet curvature uh, if there exists a, a k-jet metric, so uh, there exists a metric on this line bundle, Uh, such that, so HK, such that first it has analytic singularities, second, uh, it has strictly positive curvature, but maybe uh, because you you look at curves that are tangent to the VKs. So you need not check the curvature everywhere. You need to check the curvature only in restriction to, uh, to those uh, vectors that are tangent to VK. So if you look at the curvature of the line bundle with this metric, so it's a 1, 1 form. OK, so this is a 1, 1 form on the tangent space of XK. So you restrict it to a 1, 1 form on VK. OK, so you have, you have lambda 1, 1, P star XK. So you restrict to VK, so you get an element in lambda 1, 1 of VK star. So you take this restriction. And now you want this restriction to be strictly positive and actually bounded away by a Keller metric or a Hermitian metric restricted to VK. Well, omega k is a smooth positive to some epsilon, of course. Smooth positive Hermitian form on xk. And then third condition, you want actually that the singularities are not larger than uh, precisely uh, the singular part of your bundle. OK, and now uh, theorem. So if xv has negative k, wh why, uh, what is the reason for saying negative curvature while you take positive curvature here for xk of 1? It's because you have the duality. Uh, o xk of 1 is such that it's a tautological line. So this is contained actually in the pullback. Uh, it's a line in what? In uh, vk minus 1. Okay. So actually, uh, the curvature of v is reflected by O of minus 1. So uh, if you take O of 1, it's, it's some, something dual. Okay, so this is why I speak of negative curvature for v, 
But then this is positive curvature for OX scale one. <coughs> okay, and the theorem is that if you have such a metric, then uh, it is hyperbolic. So if X ray possesses a uh, negatively curved negative uh, has has negative k jet curvature then x v is uh, is hyperbolic So the proof, proof is uh, just the Alfors lemma for any k, for every k, for any k. If proof, well, it's very easy. You have this map that I uh, considered earlier, which, uh, so you take a curve, and then you have the k jet of the curve, and then you look at the derivative of the k minus one jet. So it maps uh, the tangent bundle of C precisely to the pullback of the tautological line by definition, minus one. Okay, but now here by assumption, you have this metric HK. So here you have a metric So essentially, this is just uh, this is just the, the k-jet derivative, okay? But now, by this uh, morphism of bundles, of line bundles, this is just a line bundle on C, uh, and this is a line bundle on C. And then you, you pull back this metric, and you get a metric on C. Well, on, but then this metric will have strictly negative curvature bounded away from zero because of this condition. So you apply Alfors lemma, this is not possible. Unless the metric that you get is identically zero. And this is still possible that the metric is identically zero because you, ha you have to allow uh, poles. And the metric being identically zero means that the curve will sit uh, in the vertical divisor, which means that it will project down uh, to a point in X. You might still have a curve in XK, uh, which, is tan which is a vertical curve, but it will not define a curve. You, you cannot avoid those curves, the vertical curves that will project two points downstairs. So this is the reason why you have to uh, admit these poles. So the poles for, uh, for these metrics uh, are, of course, the zeros, uh, the zeros for, the, for the dual. Okay, so you cannot avoid that. So the only way uh, it can have, it can not contradict the Alfors lemma is that uh, this is identically zero, and therefore it's a vertical curve, and it doesn't correspond to, I mean, uh, the, it has to be constant here. So this is the proof. Uh, um, so this is just Alfors lemma. And now it is very, very uh, tantalizing to guess that maybe the converse is true. And actually, I have made the following conjecture. Uh, in fact, for any pair,
xv is hyperbolic if and only if there exists some k large, or maybe it's for large enough. But actually, it, it's easy to check. I will not do it. That it, if it's uh, k jet uh, negatively curved, then it's uh, k plus one. So it is. If it's true for at stage k, then automatically you, uh, you have a metric at stage k. By the construction, you get a metric at the, uh, the higher stage, just by more or less uh, formal constructions. So uh, once you have negative curvature at stage k, it, it goes to higher stages. OK, so you can formulate like this. There exists some k and some hk uh, with, uh, with these properties here. So with negative k-jet curvature. OK, so not much is known. Well, for n is 1, of course, uh, the only interesting case, well, is uh, v is tx. And then uh, everything is known. Uh, and then uh, the tangent bundle is already negative for hyperbolic, and it's true for k equal 1. Okay, so you have no trouble here. K, k equal 1 is enough. So the first interesting case is n equal 2, and v is tx. Uh, the case uh, when you have a foliation on a surface it would be interesting. I have no idea. Already, uh, already, it's a non-trivial question. Uh, well, no, it's 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 answered probably. Well, you have to look at, for v affoliation. Probably, it's answered by uh, Marco Brunella's uh, theorem, but you have to analyze a little bit more. Should be true. So, for for v of rank one, it should be true by Brunella. But uh, you have to check a little bit more. Uh, with k equal 1, you gain. But for v is tx, uh, then it's unknown. And in fact, uh, there are examples for every k0. For every k0, there exists a surface <coughs> x such that it is hyperbolic but not uh, k0 negatively curved, which means that the k that you have to take already for surfaces can be arbitrarily large depending on the geometry of the surface. So this means that you, you, you really have to go to very high jets if you, ha you want to have uh, any chance of proving, uh, well, of constructing, of proving hyperbolicity. So this is a difficulty in the subject that depending on the geometry of the manifold, you may have to, to, to look at differential equations of, of extremely large order already for surfaces. Uh, so the example is in the notes. I will not have time to do it right now. Uh, I think I will make a break maybe at this point. Um, so the don't remember in which section. I think it's in section eight probably that you have this uh, example here. It's very simple. It's just uh, you just take a, fam a family of uh, of curves of high genus in protective plane and a, a, a pencil that degenerates. So you have curves of a very large genus, but you have a very, very singular fiber where the genus, genus drops to something very small. Uh, this gives a counterexample to this. So a very explicit example here. OK, I'll make a break here. Probably we could, we could use also the jets that I have just introduced this morning. It would be probably very interesting, uh, but it's a slightly different calculation, more involved. So maybe it would be a good uh, type of 
say, PhD thesis, just to, to try to uh, do in the invariant case what I'm going to explain here. Uh, it has not been known yet. Okay. So, um, so what is uh, the point? So you take XV, a directed variety, Okay, and then you have your uh, variety X here and the distribution of, of subspaces. And then here you have the K jet space, but the Green Griffiths one, okay? So let me remind that you just take the K jets tangent to V you remove the zeros, and then you take the quotient by the C star action. I, I should say that uh, the sample jets are, in fact, essentially the quotient by GK. Then instead of taking the quotient by the C star action, you take the quotient by all, uh, all uh, diffeomorphisms uh, of C0 at the origin. But it's not the GIT quotient uh, which would be singular. It's some kind of a canonical desingularization of the GIT quotient. So actually, the sample bundle is a is the most natural uh, non-singular model of of the quotient by GK. Well, I will not do, will not use this. Okay. Uh, so, what does it mean? Uh, so now you have. Uh, you have uh, one bundle, the, the old one bundle here. So you look at sections. Of the, of the O of M uh, sheaf here. It's not exactly a line bundle. It's a, a line bundle only if M uh, is uh, divisible by the lowest common multiple of 1 to K. Because... Uh, Actually, it's a singular space. And for this reason, the O of 1 is not invertible. It's only, it's only a multiple of it which is invertible, as is well known. OK. Not a real trouble. Um, so we ha if you have a section here, you get a divisor, which is a zero divisor of the section. And then if you have a curve here, So of course it lifts to a curve, which is a, just the a k-jet, not the projectivized k-jet, because I'm not, I am not uh, taking uh, just the tangents here. I'm taking all derivatives. It's uh, the ordinary k-jet, not the one I introduced uh, earlier this morning, but uh, the ordinary k-jet. Okay, so you have this lift here, and now saying that. Uh, you have the vanishing theorems means that the k-jet sits in, uh, in this divisor. And this divisor means a relation. It's just a relation between the, the, uh, the first k derivatives. OK, so now uh, what I'm going to explain is that you have a lot. You have a lot of such sections which correspond to a lot of differential equations. So you have a lot of differential equations relating those curves. Okay, so to any of these sections, uh, you have zero divisors now. You have a lot. And of course, by the vanishing theorem, you have that the k-jet of f sits in the intersection of those divisors. Of course, you have to twist by something uh, ample. You have to take a minus 1, but it's not. Well, OK. And now, uh, to, solve, to solve the green griffiths conjecture would mean that to, when you reproject down, uh, the projection of this intersection here is small enough and is a proper algebraic subvariety. 
So uh, to solve the green griffiths conjecture, but you have to, to look at dimensions. So what is the dimension here? So x is n. And here you have a k jet, so uh, it's k times r, but then you projectivize, so it's k r minus 1 plus n. So the dimension here, the dimension uh, of this space is, uh, is much larger and increases when the k increases. So you really need a lot of equations to have any chance that the projection of this set uh, will be small here. You need a lot of equations. So you want to solve Green Griffiths So you want first, first of course, to produce a, produce a lot of sections. Uh, in uh, in this, so actually, what, what is sufficient to take is the pullback is the pullback by the projection of an ample downstairs, minus one. Because it's relatively, uh, well, it's an easy argument. It's, it's enough. It comes from downstairs. And then, uh, so you want a lot of sections like this. And then you want that the projection of the intersection of the zero divisors, which you know by y, uh, is a proper algebraic subvariety uh, in X. So what I'm going to say is that one is solved. So uh, uh, now we know uh, exactly how many sections there are here asymptotically, and we know even better uh, we know how to compute asymptotically all cohomology, not just H0, but all cohomology groups HQ. So you know more. You know the H0, you know the number, uh, and you know the asymptotics of the H1, uh, etc. So it gives a lot of hope for two also, but, uh, but it's still not completely enough. So, okay, so what I will explain is solution of one, uh, even, even more. Solution of one, and in fact, uh, calculation of HQ. Okay, so for this, uh, you need uh, holomorphic Morse inequalities. So the first version of these uh, was a work of mine already long ago. Uh, but then here you, you need a slightly extended version, uh, which was done in uh, Laurent Bonavero's studies uh, in 93. Okay, so it's a very general statement. I take X a compact, compact complex manifold. Take E over X a holomorphic vector bundle of rank R. And take LH be a Hermitian uh, line bundle with a Hermitian metric H. Uh, 
Uh, then, uh, well, you look at uh, the alternating sum of dimensions of cohomology groups. But it's, it's asymptotic, so you take l very large multiples of L. So here it's the alternating sum. So you take the HQ minus HQ minus 1 plus minus Q H0. So the, the important term is HQ in some sense. OK. And then uh, you have an upper bound. This is less than the rank times k to the n over n factorial times some integral, which depends on the metric H, on some open set of the curvature form raised to power n. And then you have uh, lower order terms, small o of uh, k to the n. So what is uh, this set? So uh, you look at the, the curvature form at any point. So it's a 1, 1 form. So it's, it can be viewed as a Hermitian form, but not, not positive definite necessarily. Uh, you don't assume anything on the curvature. There's no assumption on the curvature. So you can look at the signature. Uh, so you will have the index. And so you have some kind of chambers. Uh, so the Q chamber uh, means that here you have signature n minus Q, Q. So the curvature has n minus Q uh, positive eigenvalues and Q negative eigenvalues. And of course, the boundaries uh, correspond to points where uh, it is degenerate. So the, uh, these things are open sets. And this means the union of the chambers where uh, the index is less than Q. So it's a union. It's a union for J less than Q. This is a set of points where you have index, index j. OK, so this is uh, essentially the statement. So this was my original statement when h, when h is smooth uh, from uh, 85. But we need here slightly more. So this is, uh, this is OK, OK when n h is smooth. But the main trouble is that uh, we want to work with uh, foliations that are possibly singular. We want to allow uh, poles. Uh, as I explained, this is needed. So uh, you need to have a version where h is also a singular metric. So in fact, and this is what was done by Bonavero in his thesis, uh, one can allow H with analytic singularities so H uh, is exponential minus P and phi uh, locally, uh, some log of sum of squares of uh, polymorphic functions. But you do have common zeros, so you have poles here. And then uh, this is proved essentially by, by using some spectral theory of uh, Laplace operators and so on. So you have L2 estimates which come in. And therefore, uh, 
what you compute actually is not cohomology, but L2 cohomology, which means that, in fact, what you compute is not these groups, but the groups uh, when you twist by a so-called multiplier ideal sheet. So in, in that case, you have exactly the same statement. Then you have to remove the singularities. So you just integrate. Uh, so of course, the singularities will be some kind of analytic set which would cut uh, measure 0, so it doesn't affect the integral. But then it, you don't compute uh, these groups. You compute uh, the groups when you twist with the multiplier ideal sheet. So you compute the hj of x tensor lk twisted by the multiplier ideal sheaf uh, associated to this uh, weight. So this is just the sheaf of functions, subsheaf of terms, such that there exists a neighborhood V of x, such that the integral of f square exponential minus k phi is convergent. And uh, it is always, by a theory of L2 estimates, always a coherent uh, subsheaf of OX. But anyway, assume that uh, you have analytic singularity, so it's even easier to check that it's uh, coherent. OK, uh, what I'm especially interested in is the case Q is 1. Because what you get here, so I, I, I accept the statement for granted. Uh, so it, it's old now. Uh, you, have, you have several proofs. So you have my original proof, and then the, there was later a heat equation proof by Bismuth, and then I reworked somehow the proof many times. So, well, you have quite a number of variants of the proof, but I will not explain that here. Um, OK, so for Q is 1, uh, what you get is H1 minus H0 is less. Well, I, I just uh, take E to be, uh, say, my E here will be this, uh, say, fixed. Uh, I have to twist by something minus ample. So in my application, E will be uh, A minus 1 with A ample. But anyway, you have to see that uh, A occurs in, in the right-hand side only by the rank. Somehow it's like in the Hilbert uh, polynomial. In the Hilbert polynomial, uh, the leading coefficient uh, does, doesn't depend on that E. I mean, it's just the rank that counts. So the, the, the only the rank depends on E here. Of course, uh, this depends uh, very much on E. But the influence of E is only uh, in, the, in the small terms. OK. But here, anyway, I take the rank to be 1. So what you get is that this is less than k to the n over n factorial times, oh, I forgot. forgot the sign here, minus 1 to the q. So you get then minus theta LH to the n plus negligible. But then you change signs, and then you get H0. It's, of course, larger than H0 minus H1. And then it's larger than k to the n and then the minus becomes plus. And then you have minus something small. Wow. OK. But anyway, what is very important is that now you have a criterion to produce holomorphic sections. The criterion is just that you should have more, more index 0 than you have index 1. 
you absolutely don't require any knowledge about uh, the signature or positivity or whatever. It's just some kind of averaging. If you have more integral of index zero so that is strictly positive than just index one, so this is just a difference of the two first indices, then uh, you do have sections. So, so you are extremely flexible on, on the curvature. Uh, you need only computing these two. And actually, you have similar inequalities. Uh, for instance, you would have also, uh, for HQ, you would, uh, you would prove easily from, from the general case here that you have to take the integral on indices, uh, well, uh, q minus 1, q, and q plus 1. You, you have to take uh, the three index set, the neighboring ones, uh, are the ones that are influential in the, in the uh, exact, in the, in the D-bar complex, just the neighboring ones. So you would take, uh, you would have a lower bound here by taking the neighboring ones. Okay. Anyway, I, I will not use it. Well, I will use it, but. We'll concentrate on this thing. So now uh, I, I can give the statement, which I'm going to try to prove. So I still have to define, in general, the canonical bundle. But assuming uh, V uh, possibly singular. So V is a linear subspace. Um, because possibly uh, the, the proof of, uh, of uh, Green Griffiths will require a lot of induction and uh, and so on, uh, it is important to allow uh, singularities because you, you will not be able to control singularities. So you, you really want also a singular version. Okay, so now I am going to define the canonical sheaf So uh, observe that uh, Green Griffiths is invariant by blowing up. So if you just take a birational morphism you blow up. Uh, Green Griffiths is only that you have a proper algebraic subvariety, so it, it is uh, birationally invariant. Okay, so you, you are allowed to blow up. So you can still assume that after you take a suitable blow up, um, the pullback of V will be invertible. Not invertible, but the locally free. I don't mean the, the inverse image of V. I mean the uh, Okay, so if you have a pullback, so you have a, a modification, say composition of blow-ups, okay, so you have this V here in Tx, you get of course a mu star V, which is contained in mu star Tx, and this mu star Tx is itself contained in T of uh, Tx, because you have the, the differential of mu, of course, which takes uh, like this to mu star of Tx, okay? And of course, uh, you can take the closure here. The closure will define a V-twiddle. And this V-twiddle, because it is a closure of this, it will contain this. OK, so you have quite a number of bundles. But anyway, uh, you can always achieve that this one is locally free. It's a general statement. You can always make, without you assume without torsion anyway. So uh, well, you can achieve this. Okay, so you can always uh, achieve that after a suitable pullback, uh, then uh, the Rth power now, or dual, uh, will be made invertible because it's essentially the determinant and you can make that invertible. Okay, and I'm now, uh, 
I'm going to define a map. So you take this. So you, you take R forms on Tx, and you restrict that to the linear space. So this is some vector bundle. This is a vector bundle of rank nr. But this is now, by a suitable choice of mu, this is an invertible, this is an invertible uh, sheaf. And now, of course, uh, you can look at uh, the, uh, because it's invertible, the image will be described by, by this sheaf multiplied by some ideal. So I'm going to define kv to be essentially the image. But I, I take the inductive limit uh, with respect to all possible mu's to, so as to resolve singularities, okay? And when mu, when mu is larger and larger, you somehow enlarge because of this uh, construction that uh, it, it becomes larger and larger, okay? So you have some kind of inductive limit. So I'm, I'm going to define uh, kv to be somehow uh, sufficiently uh, high level uh, uh, of this map. But anyway, you, you get in this way a sheaf which is not necessarily, uh, which is not necessarily a, a sub-bundle, but you can make it invertible after you, you blow up sufficiently, okay? So now I'm, I define uh, xv to be of general type. if kv uh, becomes big, is big, but possibly after you perform uh, enough blow-ups to, to, to get somehow convergence of the singularities, uh, after, after sufficiently many blow-ups. Well, let me give a very simple example, uh, because this might be confusing. Just consider in P2, in P2, a pencil of, of cubics, of elliptic curves. Just take a pencil. of uh, cubic elliptic curves. So it just means that you take two polynomials of degree three, P and Q, which define smooth uh, cubic curves. And then uh, because they have degree three, they will intersect in nine points. Well, I don't know if there are nine points, probably not. It must be even, but anyway, may stay hard on the blackboard. So there are, you have nine intersection points. Okay, and then, uh, well, you consider uh, precisely the V at a generic point, you have a unique element of the pencil going through this, and you take the V, which is uh, the tangents to, uh, to the pencil. So it defines uh, a rank one uh, sub-bundle in TP2. And then uh, you have, of course, uh, well, to define this pencil, in fact, you, you just look at the, uh, the sections of, of D. Uh, this is constant. This should be 0. So you have the map here, which is essentially uh, PDQ minus QDP. But because... Uh, 
because uh, this is of degree 6, so it takes you uh, this to OP2 of 6. And then a V is the kernel of this map as a sheaf, not as a linear space. So I note by curly V the sheaf, which, uh, as I explained, has to be distinguished from the linear space. So if you look at it as a sheaf, it's wrong. If you look at it as a sheaf, what happens? Well, it's not exactly subjective here. It's uh, generically subjective, of course. Uh, the, the, the quotient will be just an, uh, the uh, skyscraper sheaf uh, where you have focal points here. So you have the skyscraper sheaf here, which consists precisely of those uh, nine points. OK, but it doesn't affect uh, the first chunk class or the determinant. So if you compute what is this uh, uh, sheaf V here, so you compute determinants. So the de determinant of TP3 is O of 3. So now uh, the product uh, should be uh, what? Should be O of minus 3 here, OK? So you conclude that as a sheaf, as a sheaf, uh, as a sheaf, uh, V is just the invertible sheaf O P2 of minus 3. And therefore, if you compute naively, uh, the canonical sheaf uh, will just be V star. And you would tend to think that this V star is ample. It is ample. And therefore, you might conclude that in my theorem, uh, well, uh, you have an ample V star, so this is far enough for being uh, hyperbolic. But of course, it's not hyperbolic, because you have a family of elliptic curves. So what's wrong here is that you have completely forgotten the singularities. Because in fact, you should look not at V star, but at the image. So the rank is 1 here. So you take T, T P2. So now this is an invertible sheaf. This is actually O of 3. And then uh, this is the restriction uh, given by this, of course. Uh, and you see that you have a skyscraper sheaf here. Uh, and uh, this, this map vanishes precisely at the nine points. And now these nine points, so in fact, the, the real canonical, the real canonical that should uh, take a, a role is not this V star, but is this V star twisted by the ideal, which is exactly uh, the, 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 uh, the, multi, uh, the, uh, the ideal sheaf or maximal ideal at, at those points, which is not an invertible sheaf. So now you have to blow up these nine points. So you have P2, you blow up these nine points, which is your, your new X twiddle. And now, uh, after you blow up, you really compute the right one that you should have computed, actually, which is the, uh, the, the because on, on P2, you have, not reached, uh, you have not reached something invertible, so it's not good. And then uh, when you compute this, uh, you get actually the real canonical that you want, which is uh, the pullback O of 3. But then uh, you have to twist by minus the sum of the exceptional divisors of the points. And now it turns out that you don't get a contradiction 
that you have taken into account the singularities, and this one is no longer is no longer ample, because if you look at sections, you are looking at the polynomials of degree three m uh, that vanish at order m at each of those no, uh, nine points, and then it's not ample. Okay. Okay. So you you really have in this statement to uh, to look at the image here. And uh, reach and, and blow up enough so that you reach an invertible sheaf, exactly as I did in this example. Okay. So now uh, this is explained more detail in the notes. Now, what is the statement? So let xv be of general type. That is uh, the canonical sheaf, but the one the one computed is exactly as I said. So you you look at the image, the image sheaf, and then you blow up to make it invertible. Uh, this one is ample or big. It's enough to have big. Then, then for any A ample, ample line bundle on X, well, you do have a lot of sections. And so what is the formula? Well, H0 of X Green Griffiths into OXK of so uh, M. <coughs> well, you have a more general formula. In fact, it's true for any, not even ample, for any line bundle. We will apply it to ample, but for any thing like this, so you look at OXK of M, and then you twist by, so this is on X. One over t k times the rank, so r r is the rank of v. One plus one half plus one over k, the harmonic number, times f. This is larger than m to the dimension of the jet space, n plus k r minus one divided by n plus k r minus 1 factorial times log k to the n divided by n factorial k factorial to the r times a Morse integral And then uh, minus something which decays slowly. So this is the, the main uh, order. And with respect to the main, uh, no, sorry. It's also in factor of the log. Uh, this converges very slowly, like 1 over log k. The other term is in 1 over log k. And then, of course, you have uh, something negligible, but well, this is containing this. And eta here, what is eta?
eta is the curvature of the canonical uh, sheaf of uh, V with respect to an admi admissible metric, H V admissible. I will explain what this is. Plus, plus the curvature of your F, of course, because you twist by F. For any uh, HF uh, with an, any metric with analytic singularities, with analytic singularities. Any. And here, any. So you have to pick metrics. Uh, you pick metrics, you compute the curvature uh, of V uh, with respect to this matrix of F, you add, you have this eta, so not now eta is a one one form. Then you compute the Morse integral, and then you have this lower bound. Okay, so now if you assume a special case. Well, in fact, uh, okay, I, I, I may even remove this. Any. It's only in the consequence that I assume big. Okay, because I changed my mind. Yeah. So here I have the very general statement. I don't make any assumption. Of course, this, this integral may be negative. Then, uh, then you don't get something. So if you want the integral to be positive, so if this integral is positive, you win, of course. And to, for this integral to be positive, you, you essentially need to have something which is, uh, which is essentially positive here. But you want to twist by something which is uh, minus ample here. So you want so to conclude by the vanishing theorem, so to apply the vanishing theorem, Uh, you want you want to take f equal minus a where a is ample. So making things worse, of course, because here this term is going to be negative. So the only way you can succeed is uh, if this is positive. But of course you can. Uh, of course, uh, because uh, you have uh, I forgot there is m here. Yeah, sorry, M. So um, when M becomes large, you can take a Q, in fact, a Q ample. You, you can take it very small. So just a Q line bundle, Q divisor. And the theorem is still true when you take M very large to kill all those denominators. So you're going, going to take M very large anyway. And you have to take k very large also because you want this term to be negligible. So uh, the thing is going to be that you are going to take k extremely large. And as I explained, you don't have a control without a control on the geometry on, on the k. So depending on the geometry, you might have to take differential equations of extremely large order. But then once k is fixed, so this term will be positive. But then uh, you have to take M extremely large because of the Morse inequalities are only asymptotic in M. So you have to take M much larger. So this is essentially the way uh, the estimate has to be understood. Okay, and now, uh, well, if you assume uh, this is okay, this is okay if KV is big. Because then if kv is big, you can take this to be negative, but very small. And then this will be positive, and uh, the eta will be positive, and the Morse inequality uh, gives you the lower bound. 
Okay, so uh, now, uh, well, what has to be done? Uh, principle, it's not difficult. You, you have the most inequality, you only have to find a suitable metric. So for the proof, you have to find a suitable metric on O, X, K, Green Griffiths of, of one. Well, twisted by, twisted by O of uh, one over K R. But that, that one is given anyway. Uh, that, that one, you don't have any choice because it's, it's given from scratch. Uh, you have this bundle on X, which is given with its metric H, uh, HF. So that one you don't have to touch. So this one is given with this metric HF. You have to find a metric here. What you have is a metric here on V. So if you are on a weighted protective space, with some weight A1, uh, AK. So this is a C star action that defines the weighted protective space, which I denote by P of A1, A2, AK. So this is the weight. You have the analog of the Fubinish 2D metric. On the weighted protective space, it's just I over 2 pi times log of sum of Cj dd bar. say 2 over aj. So this is a form in C. For usual projective space, all, all aj are 1, and uh, you get the usual Fubinish 2D. But here, uh, you want uh, the form to be invariant by the C star action, because it has to, to descend to projective space. So you need, the, you need these exponents here, so that uh, when you combine with this uh, action, uh, it is invariant. Unfortunately, if you do this, uh, it will not be smooth, because of course you have roots here, so this is not smooth. But you can make it smooth by just raising to some p here and putting one over p. And if you take p to be the uh, lowest common multiple of the elements in the weight, you make it smooth. So you don't have this trouble. It is not very important. So you're going to take p equal to the lowest common multiple of the weights. So this is the analog of the Fubinish 2D metric on a weighted projective space. OK. Now I'm applying this to jets. So you take a jet, which is tangent to your V here. And then locally, you have this connection. And then you compute the derivatives with respect to your connection. And then the weights, the weights are just 1, 2k. So you just apply this formula. So the norm of your jet, of your k-jet, you define to be the sum of the derivative at 0 
But then you have to make this homogeneous with respect to the weight. So you are going to take 2p over k over j. Well, actually, I will denote by s still. So from s equal 1 to k. And then for homogeneity reasons, you have to take this to uh, 1 over p. OK, this is what you would like to define. Unfortunately, this depends on the connection. So you're not going to define a global emission metric on your uh, jet, but it will be defined only on the open set where the holomorphic connection uh, is defined. So you have to do something more complicated. So you have x, and then you have an open covering. And on each u alpha, you pick a connection, nabla alpha, on v. And then uh, you have to take a partition of unity. And then uh, what you will take x. So you're taking a jet such that f of 0 is x. Okay, So you're a jet based at point x. Okay, And then you take the sum OK, something like this. And now uh, this is OK. You've, you've used a partition of unity. So here you get a metric. You get a metric on, uh, on jets. And, and therefore, on the tautological uh, line bundle, you get a metric on OXK of 1. So this defines a metric. Well, you. Okay, the, the CK is the CS uh, in my notation here. The CS is just, it's just this in the local trivialization. And then the collection C1, C2, CK uh, defines the point in the, in the fiber of the Green-Griffiths bundle. Uh, this is just a metric uh, on the total line bundle. So this gives a metric on OXK Gengriffis of minus 1. Say. OK, but then you, you, you are, you are mm, a bit suspicious that this can be computable uh, because, of course, you have this terrible partition of unity. Uh, it seems that there is no hope of computing the curvature of such a, a beast. OK. But because, uh, of course, the, I forgot here alpha. So what you are going to do, in fact, is to put some additional weights, epsilon s. And you are going to take epsilon 1 equal 1, but very, very large compared to epsilon 2. And you take smaller and smaller coefficients up to k. So what happens is, of course, when you change the connection, you change the successive derivatives. But it turns out by a calculation, the change in each derivative is controlled by the previous derivatives and it's completely negligible because of this arrangement of weights. So this is going to a change of coordinate. When you have a change of coordinate, essentially you don't change the first derivative of a curve. You change the acceleration, but then the acceleration, the change of acceleration is given by a square of the first derivative. 
And then uh, ev everything that you modify by changing the connection is controlled by the previous terms, but it's completely negligible because of this arrangement. So then it means that you completely kill the influence of the partition of unity. So you can do as if you would have no partition of unity up to error terms, which depend only on the epsilons. So you are done with this difficulty. And now uh, you can completely compute the curvature and because I'm already almost three or four minutes uh, from the end. Uh, I will give you the formula. You, it turns out that you can completely compute the curvature of this thing that looks complicated, but nevertheless, uh, just a matter of differentiation. Uh, just dd bar, you have to compute dd bar of this. Uh, and you get the following formula. So where is it? Okay. So curvature So I will denote by, uh, say, psi k epsilon this metric. OK, then you get 1 over p times the, the Fubini 2D metric on the fibers, which depend on P. Uh, it, de well, it depends on the choice of P here. But anyway, fix P. Okay. Well, okay. So this is in the fiber variables. And then uh, you have something which is in the, in the base coordinates. So here you compute with a metric on V. And then uh, you have the curvature tensor. This is the formula. So let me explain the formula. So uh, you have the base manifold x here, and here you have holomorphic coordinates z1, zn. Here you have the jet, jet bundle. So the, the, the fiber coordinates are just the xc1, xck, and the xs is just the s derivative of your jet, a zero. OK, and here you have the curvature on the whole space, which is completely split. Terms which are the Fubinich 2D on the weighted projective space here. And a term, and this is the curvature actually of V star with the dual metric that you take on V. This is a calculation. So this is a curvature of, of your, your, your given metric, because of course you compute things. Uh, here it's with the given metric on V. Okay. Well, this is a calculation. Okay, so it looks, uh, well, at least it's computable, but it looks not very sympathetic. But 
Now, other next idea, use polar coordinates. So it means that your, your vector, you are uh, putting actually as xs s over 2p times us. So us is cs divided by the norm of cs. And xs would be the norm, but you, you put it to the 2p over s. because of these weights. So now what you get is the unit sphere in your uh, vector bundle V. And these are the unitary vectors that are the, uh, the successive derivatives, but renormalized to, to have norm one. So you, you are looking actually at the successive directions that you get. So this is just the, uh, the, the derivative uh, of order k divided by its norm. So you look at, at those uh, unitary vectors. And now in this term, uh, the curvature now becomes more tractable. I need one more minute to co complete. The, I will not do the uh, calculation, but I will just give the uh, final idea because there uh, are at least 20 pages of calculations and estimates and so on. Just the idea. So then after you make this change of, of, of variables in polar coordinates, what you get, well, you still have the Fubinich 2D, which is very good. Why did I put uh, 1 over p? No, 1 over p is already in the finish to this. Sorry, so no 1 over p. Plus, and now it becomes uh, much simpler. Where is it? Still too complicated for me to remind. Well, just. I don't think uh, it can be wrong here. So, so xs over s times uh, and here you have u just us alpha us beta bar. Okay, I, I forgot to fix notation. So uh, us is a vector, so it has components us1, usr. So these are just the components I'm using here. And then you have dzi by dzj bar. And now, uh, well, you can view the projective space as a uh, circle quotient of a pseudosphere. So this is the pseudosphere, and the pseudosphere is just defined actually by the simplex uh, x1. In my notation, the pseudosphere is just x1 plus xk is 1. So in fact, I'm viewing my fiber as essentially a product from s equal 1 to k of the spheres. Uh, this is uh, somehow a tower of projective spaces. And so you have uh, k times the sphere, and then you have the, uh, the, the excess variables, which are norms. And the norms, they define this, uh, this k minus one dimensional simplex. Okay, so you have replaced this weighted projective space by a product of spheres times a simplex, which from the viewpoint of uh, Lebesgue measure is the same space. 
But of course, uh, you, you've forgotten the uh, genetic structure. But anyway, from a point of view of integration, you are integrating on this by the change of variables. OK. And now what do you get? Well, you get the curvature of V star, which you average on points. You, you pick all derivatives here. And you look at the, this is the curvature, the curvature of V star at point US, which is the S derivative. And now you average, which means that you consider uh, your derivative as random variables. You, you take the average. So you take the expected value by considering your jet as a random variable and taking the expectation of the curvature by adding the curvature uh, at points which are just the S derivative. And now you have weights. So it's not exactly an average because you have weight S. So the first derivative counts with weight 1, the second with weight 1 half, and the case 1 with weight 1 over k. It's not really a trouble because uh, the harmonic series is still divergent. So you are looking at a, actually a Monte Carlo process. So you are playing dices, dice, sorry. You are playing dice. You are picking randomly the derivatives. And you are putting weight 1, 1 half, 1k to the derivatives and taking a summation of the curvature at those random points. But then by Monte Carlo, it will converge probabilistically to uh, the average on the sphere because the harmonic series is divergent. If it would have been convergent, it would not be the case. So now you have to estimate uh, the deviation of this random variable, and then the, it depends on the Chan classes and so on. So you to really to deal with some complicated curvature calculations. Anyway, it works. And so you see that probabilistically, this converges actually to the integral, but the integral of a quadratic form is just its trace. Because uh, when you have... Uh, sum of lambda j u j square, you integrate on the unit sphere in u, you get essentially a constant times sum of lambda j. Because all, all coordinates have the same weight. Therefore, the average on the sphere is just the trace of the curvature tensor. But the trace of the curvature tensor is just the curvature of the determinant of the bundle, which is a canonical bundle. So this is the basic idea. That because of Monte Carlo and because of the probabilistic behavior of the jets, uh, you have a convergence to the trace of the curvature, which is just the, tra the curvature of the canonical bundle. Of course, you have to take into account singularities and so on, so you have to use Bonavero's version. And then you compute the Merce integral, but if you assume that the, the canonical is big, you have positive curvature, and then your Morse integral converges to something positive. The convergence is extremely slow, because of the very slow divergence of the harmonic series, which is in log k, which explains why uh, you have convergence in 1 over log k in, in, the, uh, in the estimate. So this is very hard to, to tackle algebraically because you have such a slow convergence that you, can, you cannot compute, or, I mean, even with a computer. I mean, my student, Simone Di Verio, completely uh, exploded the, the computers in Rome by tr trying to make calculations. Uh, so it doesn't, I mean, it's very hard. But at least uh, if you, if you are content yourself with weak estimates, it's OK. In fact, you can get even explicit estimates and even get explicit bounds of, of, on degrees of hypersurfaces and so on. So it's done in the in uh, section 11. So if you are courageous enough to read, then you will, you will get even explicit estimates. Uh, so I'm going to stop here.